Seeds for Growth on the Columbus Collaborative is a co-production of Huntington Bank and WOSU Public Media. We have so much great brain power in our community, experts in their field who can talk on, many, on so many different topics. So we decided to bring a whole bunch of different topics together and share them in a really, really fast-paced fast pace, uh, way. The German is coming out. <laughs> Anyhow, so what we will do is we will share 30 ideas with you in 30 minutes. We have six subject matter pa experts here. Each will share with you five ideas. They will each have one minute per idea and will go boom, boom, boom. So this will be fun. It will be interactive. Are we all comfortable? Is the panel ready? <coughs> Jamie, you're it. <laughs> Off we go. Okay, we're going to talk about social media, and to start and frame this up in 60 seconds, I'm going to give you my quick definition of social media, and that is niche conversations that your user defines. I think many of us, when we think about social media or social web or whatever you want to call it, we think about the technology, and it's not about the technology. It's about the people that are involved and the conversations that are involved there, so it's not a push mechanism. It's enabling our organizations and the folks that work for us to help the audiences that we serve, whether those be our funders, whether those be our ultimate end users, or whether they're stakeholders in the community. So it's a great way for us to talk with the people that our work affects. Um, I want to give a quick example, and I hope Pat Kramer doesn't mind. Um, it's about Capital University, and I think this really illustrates the power of social media for an organization. Capital embarked on a campaign called the I Will Campaign. And capital students are very unique, very driven, driven students, and they all have unique perspectives of them about what they want to do with their lives. Well, they partnered with an organization in town that specializes in creative called Ology. And what they did was they enabled the students to say, I will. And it was everything from, I will go to class this week, to I will solve the world. And that's a great example of how using the people that are involved in your organization to show the power and what you want to accomplish. So let's talk about leadership. I want to split a very coarse hair. There is a difference between leadership and management. You manage things and you lead people. Everybody in this room is a leader in the community and in your organizations. So first and foremost, I'm, I'm going to touch on four aspects of leadership today. Uh, the first one I want to hit is leading yourself. What do you care about? And we've asked people on a regular basis, why do you go to work every day? And, and whether it's for profit or nonprofit, the answers are always the same. It's not the money. Clearly, in your line of work, it's probably not the money. I know what your budgets are like. Um, it's not your boss, so it's not about you. Sort of get over yourself. It's about the work. It's about the colleagues, and it's about the growth opportunities. So understand about yourself, first and foremost, what drives you, why are you doing what you do, what excites you, and then understand it about your people. How do you create those growth opportunities for them? How do you engage them in things they care about and make it interesting, interesting and exciting for them? But lead them. They're not things. They're people. Wow. Perfect. Wow. <laughs> All right. I'm toast. Okay. So, <laughs> so um, Artie Isaac and uh, the lieutenant governor really set the framework for the notion of being social entrepreneurs. And the notion of the imperative to go towards fear as leaders in this community in the not-for-profit world. Don't go away from fear. So I'm going to, in terms of framing principles for my five ideas, think in terms of being opportunistic, being entrepreneurial, leveraging your strengths and your core competencies. Each and every one of us in this community has that. Um, find those partners. Utilize business resources on your boards, people that you know in business. So. My first idea in terms of what Goodwill did, you know good cars, good deal, goodwill, right? Our, our auto auction. We spent a year developing a business plan, and third quarter of 2004, we launched this um, used auto auction business. We looked at experts from Washington, D.C., Pittsburgh, Cincinnati, Dayton, those who had done that before to learn how it was done. We think we put together a great plan. Um, in, in the past five years, We've sold 7,000 cars. We've generated more than a million dollars in earned revenue over expenses to commit to our mission. 
Uh, there are other examples out there, simple business you can do, low cost to get into it, and it helps people who need cars to get affordable cars, and also helps people who want to give, get away, give their cars away to give them away and get some tax credits. So that's, that's an example of, of a way to earn some money. Thank you. Robin. As a newspaper uh, editor by trade, it pains me to tell you that the number one thing you can do in public relations and media relations is be the media. You're going to not filter your messages and your storytelling through traditional outlets. You are the publisher, you are the broadcaster, you are the media. And don't be daunted by the fact that it's not that expensive. Uh, you know, you can be producing your own YouTube videos for, uh, with equipment that costs less than $1,200, and usually with a 17-year-old who can do it for you. Um, <laughs> so you are the media. Um, the other I want, and, and this ties into what you heard about social media. Right now, uh, using Facebook is our number one way to get out uh, interesting new programming topics, new community efforts that we're doing, versus the shrinking news hole of local um, news outlets. We don't ignore them, but we, we've had to create our own ways to communicate versus relying on traditional outlets. And the best thing about this is if you do a good job of setting yourself up, you're going to have the reporters following you for stories. Chuck. Okay, mergers, uh, acquisitions, and partnerships in a minute. My first thought is uh, that we all should be having uh, holding board level discussions right now concerning this topic. To go back to Lieutenant Governor Fisher skating toward the puck. Uh, even if you think you will never be a merger or a mergee, um, there's so many opportunities out there right now. And the old saying is that in a bad economy, there's a lot of people get rich in a bad economy, right? And there's a lot of opportunities out there right now. So how can we get together and figure out how we can do things better? And I encourage you, I called Stephen a couple of weeks ago, and I said, how many board members are here today because it's open to them? And he said, four. So whoever you are, uh, I know there's more than that, but uh, sometimes staff is not that excited about having board-level discussions about merging. But you need to do them. There's so many opportunities. There's so many possibilities out there right now, and it's a great way to go. And I call them vertical and horizontal mergers Horizontal being something like when we merge Life Care Alliance with the Columbus Cancer Clinic, or uh, vertical being something like the Girl Scouts merging Girl Scout chapters across the state. Just a lot of different ways to go. And even if you're a college, hey, remember University of Toledo and Medical College of Ohio got together and saved millions. Great. Thank you. Annie. Ask not what your board can do for you. Ask what you find out what you can do for your board. If I look at empathy... Empathy is the key to great boards. It's also the key to great communication. And I find that a lot of nonprofit executives have great empathy for their constituents, for their staff, for the people they serve. But it kind of stops at the board. You're trying to figure out, what can I get from them? What can I get from them? What can I get from them? Uh, but really great boards uh, are the ones that take care of those board members. So think about what you have to offer them and how you can educate them. Give them professional development opportunities. We know that people join boards for a couple of reasons. Yes, they're interested in the cause and the mission, but they're interested in there for networking opportunities, and they're also there to test their skills in areas that they don't get to use every day on the job. So with that said, have all kinds of speakers come in. Make sure they're invited to them. Provide networking opportunities. Hook people up. Um, do thought leadership uh, opportunities. Put together white papers. But have your boards co-write them and co-author with them. So give them some love. Awesome. <laughs> Jamie. Okay, so there are two great opportunities, I think, for social media for nonprofits. The first one is listening, and I think that's one that we often forget about. We often think that Facebook and LinkedIn and Twitter are great ways to broadcast our message, but they're also great ways to listen. And by listening, we hear what the needs from the community is and how we can fill that void. So how do you listen, and where do you go to listen? Um, there are lots of ways that you can pay for services, but as nonprofits, let's focus on the free ones. Um, there are search functions within many of these places. A great one that encompasses a few is called Ice Rocket. It's icerocket.com. So what do you look for? You look for the keywords that people associate with your company. And then once you find those, are you being mentioned? And if you are, is it positive? Is it negative? 
is it neutral and who's being mentioned with you and those are really your competitors because in our world when we're looking at funding and folks coming to our events and participating not only are we competing with those that we traditionally feel are competitors or you know come at funding this from the same angle as we do but there are many other people that are fighting for that same listening or that are talking and we need to you know grab a part of that piece of the pie so the other ooh, next idea next time <laughs> Okay, so I talked about leading yourself. Now let's talk about leading the thinking and setting a vision for your organization. I'm a capitalist, unashamedly so. Uh, I run a for-profit organization. I've been on the corporate side. And as it was mentioned earlier, when you're seeking partnerships with corporations, what's in it for them? How can you paint a compelling picture for that organization of why they should work with you? What are the benefits to their associates, to their constituents, and how can they get their associates involved? Additionally, being able to paint that picture for your team rather than standing still, as Lieutenant Governor Fisher pointed out. You have to let them know where they're going. Get that engagement. Get something out there in terms of a vision and a mission that's going to resonate with your folks. It's not good enough to just say, we support the community. We're doing charitable work. Paint a compelling and exciting picture for them to be a part of. Wow. He's got this down to an art. <laughs> Can I have his 10 seconds? Sure. Yeah. There you go. Well, <laughs> I, think, I think you already had him. I'm Margie, always sorry. negotiating here. <laughs> so more examples of, of ways to secure earned income. Goodwill actually, many of you may not know, operates uh, two other businesses. We operate uh, contract service businesses. We're in the janitorial and security services business. Those two businesses generate $5.5 million a year in revenues. They also are the quintessential convergence of our mission and our margin, as we talked about. Many of those individuals that are employed, 170 individuals that are employed, are people that have disabilities. The second business, as many of you know, we operate is our retail stores. That generates $4 million in revenue each year and, again, employs many people that are in transition um, or who have barriers to employment. So those are two businesses. Think about it. There are many individuals in this audience I know that are entrepreneurs. Uh, Salvation Army, I know Jeannie is here, Fisher, they run retail operations. Tom Stofak with Lutheran Social Services just told me this morning that he operates a lawn care business. Uh, you know, Chuck Gehring, Life Care Alliance, um, he prepares meals every day. He started a catering business. Uh, Tammy Wharton is shaking her head. She sells cookies with uh, Girl Scouts. But yeah, see? Lots and lots of examples of individuals that, uh, that do that. The YMCAs run rec centers. I know Kathy Kerr is here. So you're all social entrepreneurs and have something to market and sell for your mission. Awesome. I want you to lead every marketing or public relations or de uh, development outreach with results. And I mean by that, I want you to tell me a story. The lieutenant governor did a great job. He told you a story. Your funders, everybody's asking you to input uh, data, and it, you're going to input slice and dice data all day long. I want you to tell me a story. And your clients are more willing than you will ever give them credit for it to tell their stories. I had a newspaper story we did last week, and I had four participants who wanted to be involved in that, and the paper just needed one or two. The other thing is tying to social media. Jamie's right, it's listening. Your social media outlets can be an incredible way to collect your stories. People feel very comfortable, they're at home, they're, it's a very casual, non-threatening environment, and they'll tell you their stories. Great, thank you. Chuck? Well, as you probably uh, figured out by now, I'm currently working on a major merger between my organization, Life Care Alliance, and the national organization, Hair Club for Men. <laughs> <laughs> and, but if you're not quite ready yet for a merger, Press Southworth says hire me please, uh, if you're not quite ready for a merger, I would suggest maybe sharing an administrative function with another agency. A great place to start is either your accounting or HR department. What can you do together? Uh, we currently actually process the financial statements and uh, the payroll for another agency. They pay us about a third of what they used to pay, and this other agency has six total employees. To give you an idea, they pay about a third of what they used to pay to a payroll processor or an accounting firm, and we get a little money in. So what a good deal, right? Uh, we also can suggest something like sharing a billing system. 
uh, Delaware County's Meals on Wheels program uses our meal system right now. And again, they pay us to use it. They didn't have to reinvent the wheel. They don't have to do the upgrades. They don't have to do the IT aspects of it. And we get a few bucks in. Great way to get together, learn each other's systems, and uh, save a few bucks at the same time. The future ain't what it used to be. It's my favorite Yogi Berra quote when I think about the economy. I mean, the economy has changed big time. And guess what? People talk about turnarounds. It's not going back, not going back to the way it used to be. Ever, ever. Um, so as far as a board, what do you need to do with that? I would encourage and challenge each and every one of you to conduct and host a revenue generating session with your board. It's a little bit about Mar what Margie's talking about, but how do you get your board involved? Spend two to three hours, make sure everybody knows when you come to this session, all you're going to do is talk about how you can make money or save money with the current resources you have access to. And I've done this with several nonprofit boards, and I can tell you, it works. Um, they're very simple things that you can do, and, and also much more elaborate things. If you're interested, I do have kind of a, a neat little uh, matrix that you can share with your board. Just email me. My stuff's in there somewhere um, about what you can follow to help use and figure out how you can leverage your talents to make money. People want to help people. Um, and what all of you have not only is a great story, but a lot of passionate people that work for you, a lot of great people that you help. And enabling those staff that are passionate about the cause, the people that you've helped to visually, um, through video, through picture, through text, whatever it translates the best through, to show how your organization impacts those people that other people care about is a great way to show the value of what you all do. And like Robin said, it's cheap, it's easy. You could buy a flip video camera for $99. Many of your staff have camera phones. They have digital cameras. that You can post how what you all do really affects the positive impact that we can have on our community. And that's probably the easiest way that you can use social media to show the value that you all have in our community. And it's fast, it's easy, and all it takes is a little education for your staff to show them how they can turn their passion into a way to help your organization reach its business goals. I'm going to give those 10 seconds to Margie. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I already talked about leading yourself and leading the thinking. Now let's talk about the one we always think about with leadership, which is leading your people. Um, you folks are really good at being empathetic and understanding your constituents. The question I'd put in front of you is, are you equally as good at understanding and being empathetic with your associates? As a 22-year-old young man, I was pretty fortunate to have an uh, interesting job description, was, which was blow stuff up and run stuff over. Uh, I was a tank platoon leader in the United States Army. And at one point, uh, the colonel came looking for me, probably to yell at me for some uh, varied and sundry reason, and he asked my driver, where's Lieutenant Figliolo? And my driver pointed to a pair of boots sticking out from under the tank. I was under the tank turning a wrench, and it was about 3 in the morning, uh, it was cold, it was muddy, but my driver was tired. I lived his life. It was important. That story got around the battalion in about two minutes flat. Um, I cared about my people. Do you understand the challenges your folks are facing in the organization and keeping them engaged? You are good. <laughs> <laughs> Man, he's good. Uh-oh. Uh, so in the spirit of... Uh, of finding those partners and collaborators. We're all working together in this community where there's alignment and synergism. Uh, Linda Danter is here, I think, from New Directions Career Center. We, uh, they, as many of you know, may have started and operated the clothing closet. It is clothing, many of you may have donated your clothing to that great project uh, to give to women in transition who are looking for that first job. They knew that wasn't their core competency, retail and clothing. They wanted to focus in on the training of those women. They were looking for somebody to turn that, that, that project over to, that uh, effort over to. They found a fit in us. We were able to open up three clothing boutiques in three of our retail stores, open seven days a week, instead of the one day a week that those stores were opened and that the one day a week where the clients could come. So now we're providing that fabulous service Two individuals, um, who 400 women last year received services from us, much more accessible. We're looking to open up a men's clothing boutique as part of it, because men need those clothing, that clothing too. We're also able to generate additional income from those boutiques from our general shoppers. So think creatively and collaboratively. 
I want you to make a commitment to train all of your staff members, every single one of them, as if they were a sales agent for you. The governor used the term economic development. I, uh, I'm a big believer that you have to start instilling in all agencies a culture, and it starts with the vocabulary of sales. And to me, a customer is anybody who authorizes a payment to your agency. It's somebody who's the uh, fiscal agent at a funder. It's a parent who may be able to open their checkbook and write a check for services. They are your customers. We all get hung up on uh, terms like participants and clients. They're customers. And I want you to commit to a training where every single person knows the company elevator speech. Because as the governor said, the backyard barbecue test in Ohio is you're there. The neighbor walks up and says, so what do you do? and make sure every program director who comes at a setting like this can cross-sell and knows the elevator speech for the other programs. Nice. Share a building. Um, with this economy the way it is, many people have unfortunately cut back on their staff. So there are some open uh, places out there and we're all paying the air conditioning bill whether we use the space or not. And we're very fortunate today to be sitting in a great example of that WOSU being here at COSI, right? Mm -hmm. uh, what a great thing to do. But there are many other ways you can share buildings. I know the Columbus Literacy Council and First Link, for example, um, each rent part of a building, but they share the receptionist, common space, copiers, things like that. Uh, so there are many, many opportunities out there. If there's a for-profit in the audience here, I don't know, maybe like the Huntington, and they were cutting back in some of their buildings and they had some extra space, what a great idea to maybe have a not-for-profit come in and use that space. Now, for the not-for-profits here like me, that doesn't mean for free. They still need to pay the bills, but still it's a much better deal. And when you start recognizing all the things you can cut it back on, like copiers, telephones, receptionists, all that sharing is incredible, and you'll find you'll be able to concentrate on your core mission, serve more people at a far reduced cost. Great boards aren't afraid to look in the mirror. Whether it's a good hair day or a bad hair day, they do something about it. You know, keeping board members accountable is tough. I mean, it's tough, but it has to be done. So uh, what I would suggest is working with your board chair to make sure that he or she is, takes a very active role in keeping, th keeping people accountable. Sure, we all have those roles and responsibilities that we all pull out every time, but make your board members sign them annually. Post attendance of, of who is and is not coming to meetings. Have a financial contribution mandatory. That's a mandate. I don't care if it's $20 or $200, um, but you need to show 100% participation of board contributions. Accountability is absolutely key if you want to move on and, or you want to have a strong board. And again, make sure your chair board chair is the heavy on that. What if someone says something negative, and what if that someone is one of your employees? Before you implement a strategy, before you start to use any of the tools, there's a culture that needs to happen within your organization. And part of that culture change has to do with the policy. And the policy isn't, you may only do this between this time and this time. The policy is some guidelines, best practices, how, how we think that the usage of these tools are a part of the strategy to get us from point A to point B and what your role in that is. When you're speaking upon the company or on behalf of the company, what does that mean for the organization? What issues are we facing that you need to be aware of that you might be asked? And if you are asked, how do you respond to that? Should you disclose yourself as an employee of the company? Yes, you should. Um, all of these things are a part of a policy, and IBM lays it out, I think, very, very clearly. You can Google IBM social media policy, and they do it really well. But essentially what it is is don't be an idiot. Um, <laughs> You know, that sounds silly, but it's true. I mean, oftentimes we think that I can say something to the person in front of me and the person in the back doesn't hear me. But really, everything, not only is it right there, but it's indexed forever. So education for your staff is crucial. So I'm going to hit on leading your people again. Jim, you've heard this story before. Um, first, you have two ears and one mouth for a reason, right? Listen to your people. Again, you listen to your constituents. I challenge you to listen to your people and your team members as well. Um, let me share a story. I had a soldier at one point who was not exactly the model soldier. Uh, a lot of discipline problems, um, showing up drunk at formation kind of things, you know, pretty egregious behavior. 
And we were out at Gunnery. It was a hot summer, and I sent my driver out with five bucks to go get some sodas uh, from the PX down the, down the uh, drive. And I said, you need one Pepsi, a Diet Coke, a Mountain Dew, and a 7-Up. And he came back and handed them out to the people I had told him to. And this particular problem child soldier looked at my driver and said, you knew I drank 7-Up? And he said, no, the lieutenant did. And this soldier looked at me and says, you know I, drank seven, I drink 7-Up? I said, yeah. The next day, a different guy showed up at work because somebody cared about Dan. Not specialist so-and-so, not the loader on this tank. It was Dan. And Dan mattered to somebody else in the organization. It has a profound effect on your people. Know them as individuals. So in the spirit of, quote, filling the gap, uh, Chuck touched upon filling the gap in terms of excess capacity with facilities, and I was going to touch upon that as well. Let me talk about two aspects of filling the gap. One is on facilities. We just completed a $9.6 million renovation of our facilities, have terrific capacity, a 20,000-square-foot state-of-the-art workforce development training facility. Uh, Dale's here, Dale Abram from Groundwork Group. He needed training space for computers. We had it. He is using some of our space to train individuals. They're coming into our space. We're getting to know him, and we're getting to know those individuals who, who may need additional training. The City of Columbus just closed down their Northwest Career Center, transferred all of their programs, but their one program they couldn't find a home for was their janitorial training program for their high school students. We're in the janitorial business. We got together with them. We've taken over that program, have some excess space in our facilities, and we're able to train those students so that they can have a career and also fill some need in terms of generating some expenses. Think about that. Um, and think about stimulus dollars, and the next time around I'll talk to you about how we go after some of those stimulus dollars to fill the gap. If you aren't already tired of people giving you new metrics, I'm going to give you one. All of your marketing efforts should be measured by one thing, your NPS, your net promoter score. At the end of the year, you should be able to survey every stakeholder group and measure those. It's a real simple calculation. Those who say they will recommend you to appear minus those who say they won't, whether that's funders, uh, clients, um, donors, in our case, employers. It's all about uh, engaging the stakeholders at every level and listening to them. You know, a lot of times we don't ask them enough questions because I think sometimes we're afraid what they'll say. The most important question you can ask them, will you recommend us to appear? Um, I think this also challenges your organization to measure all levels of your customer interface. It's not just the head of an agency or the end user. It's going to force you to measure at all levels. Form a purchasing group is my next one, and uh, that sounds a little odd, but there are, if you just Google purchasing groups, as I did yesterday, you'll get a whole list of people who have already formed them, and they're companies that for a modest fee you can join and take advantage of all the discounts they've already determined for you. Um, and there's fabulous stuff on there. Another, you know, if you don't want to do that and you don't want to pay the fee for whatever reason, uh, get together with some of the organizations that are similar to you and try to go in and order things together. I know in our world of food, everything is volume. So the more you buy, the cheaper it gets, and that's certainly true in a lot of our worlds. There's many things you can do like that. And, and another little quickie idea here, you're probably aware that the state of Ohio prefers and requests that when you pay your workers' compensation premiums, you use an American Express card, right? You know that? Well, if you don't, that's their preferred way. Sign up for a business American Express card, and you get points. And you can buy all kinds of goodies. We save $3,000 after the first six months of paying our workers' comp charges. We bought gas cards and put the gas in our vans for three grand in one month. People rarely succeed at something they're not enjoying doing, right? If you're not having fun, you're usually not very good at it. And it's very interesting to me that a lot of nonprofit people work very hard to orient, uh, recruit, and get the right people on their board to put them in a room and bore the heck out of them every month in a meeting. So for goodness sakes, have some levity. Even if your issue is a life or death issue, then you need humor even more. Um, so spice up your meetings. Don't have it just be a reporting mechanism. 
Make sure also, on the, on the other side of it, bring up the meaty issues. Your board members want to be involved in the tough stuff, you know, situationally. <laughs> also, make sure you're efficient in those kind of meetings. Use consent, consent agendas and other things as appropriate. Uh, and make sure that you energize them. How, how do they want to be energized? Give them a story. Make it fun. Make it fun. Um, so overall, um, when, you're, when you're doing those board meetings, think about doing things off-site. Shaking it up, bringing in an outside speaker. I'm sure, you could get some of these people for free, right? Uh, so make sure it, you you make sure you you um, kind of change it up. Have some social time. Have a good time. Here's some levity. Hits <laughs> are how idiots track success. Um, in our world, eyeballs really aren't are what we measure anymore. As nonprofits, even what we're doing in the online world should be measured back to business goals. Your board will never ask you how many friends you have on Facebook. They want to know how what you're doing translates into your business goals, and that's what you should report on. We don't measure eyeballs. We measure, measure engagement. So, for instance, what does the chamber get out of social media? A few months ago, we had someone literally on their membership application, and their reason for joining, write Twitter. And I think that threw some people for a loop. So what does that mean? Did they join because the chamber's on Twitter? No, they joined because the value that they were getting on Twitter from information, from interacting with our staff, made them know that if they join the chamber, they're going to get even more. And that's what we report to our executive staff. That's how we measure ourselves. It's about our business goals. It's not about how many friends, how many fans, how many connections. It's about what all that means in the long term for a business goal. So on the topic of levity, uh, one day I showed up at work at Capital One. I knew it was going to be a particularly difficult day when I looked at my calendar and the meeting slate was awful. Uh, I grabbed coffee at Burger King on the way into work, and they had a stack of crowns. So I grabbed one and I wore it all day. Okay? I was talking about the R squared of an analytical model. I was talking about performance reviews with people wearing the Burger King crown. And folks looked at me like I had finally lost it, um, which is not out of the realm of possibility, okay? <laughs> but they asked, why are you wearing that crown? Did you lose a bet? You know, what, what's going on here? I said, because. And I said, and if you have to ask the question again, you'll never get it. You'll never understand it. What we do is critically important in the nonprofit world and the for-profit world. It's critically important. But get over it, right? It's not life and death unless you're a surgeon, right? And surgeon wearing a Burger King crown, you are not operating on me. <laughs> but get over it. Bring some levity into the workplace. Bring perspective in there. Keep people's minds in the game and let them know, hey, it's not as critical. Don't get all wound up over it as you're currently doing. Again, in the spirit of filling that gap, um, how many people in this room, raise your hands real quick, um, are going after federal stimulus dollars and grants? Okay. Uh, how to get from here to there? We have two years of these dollars flowing into us. I know it's the paralysis of analysis to try to figure it out on the one hand. On the other hand, use your national organization. We did. Um, our National Association, they identified, helped us identify seven pots of money that relate to the work that we do to clear away that underbrush of all those other programs. We're now going after nine separate federal grant opportunities. We've gotten three, totaling $150,000. We're waiting to hear on another $1.2 million worth. Find out about that. Those are those gap dollars that can take you from here to there as we continue to need to serve these really vulnerable populations of individuals. So find out who collaborators can be locally. We're collaborating with several of the organizations in this community. We're collaborating with other goodwills around Ohio. Uh, and we're really working to find out from the state and from uh, our national association how to capture those dollars. I'm impressed, Margie. You did it. <laughs> One minute. Fifth time's a charm. <laughs> well, this is the non-levity moment. Be prepared to protect your organization's reputation in an instant. You, um, unfortunately, bad things happen to good people and to good organizations. Your organization's name will always be your most valuable asset. Um, you, if you work with a good crisis communications planner, you will be able to identify your vulnerabilities very quickly and have maybe up to eight to ten pre-done news releases in a drawer somewhere that are approved by the attorneys, that have been vetted however they need to be vetted, and you just fill in the names or the dates and the times. 
you need to be prepared because the 24-7 media these days will not wait for you to call three people and call them back. The story will run. They may update it later on the website, but they're going to go without you, so be ready. Use your website, and remember, you are the media. You're going to publish your own versions of things and updates. And most importantly, give your employees a role to play and give them uh, information so they know what to say within their line of responsibility. Well, first of all, thanks for uh, listening to us, especially me, because I know the people out here in this audience, as they look around, have a, a lot better ideas than I could ever come up with. But uh, we were asked to do this, and Elfie gives us money, so here we are. <laughs> hey, not me. So, so not, okay, well, then you need to send her a proposal, Ann. Uh, but I know we have a lot of development and advancement people in the audience, and I guess one thought that is kind of odd is doing a fundraiser together. And I've, I've called a couple of other organizations from time to time. We've discussed this thought, and it always gets a lot – I always get a lot of pushback. And it's because, well, we want to raise the money for ourselves. Well, I'm not saying that you shouldn't. I'm just saying go together to increase your reach, increase your brand power, uh, because if you put brands together, it'll be more powerful, and increase your marketing opportunities. So think about if we had an event here in town – that was uh, Meals on Wheels, plus the Girl Scouts, plus American Red Cross, plus a lot of other things, man, you'd have a hard time saying no to us, wouldn't you? So it's uh, that power, and I think especially when we go for grants, if we can partner, and I've called some people in the last year, and they've said, oh, we don't want to, you know, we're just going to send in the grant ourselves. Well, great. You have a far less chance of getting it, and I think if we work together, we'd have a much better chance, power to the people type of thing, getting that money in. Speaking of power, two of the most powerful words in the English language are thank you, and they always will be. Um, sure, you all do a lot right now to thank your board, but come up with some more creative ways to do it, and they're inexpensive. For example, if your board members have done a particularly stellar job, why don't you send a letter to their employer, if they're the CEO, to their board? Hey, so-and-so did this for us this year, and we think that she is fabulous. It will go a long way. Take photos of your board's doing, your board members doing things, whether they're attending an event um, or even a meeting, um, and use the great things that Robin and Jamie are teaching you today to post those things on your web. Get them on social media. Give them some you know, major press. And they're all different good ways to say thank you. And those are the ones that are going to get noticed. So speaking of which, since I'm the last one, I will say thank you guys for listening to us. Wow. I am a <laughs> really focusing on your associates today, the people who work with you, because that's the relationship we need to particularly nurture. You don't want your living brand to go out and say, eh, I don't feel that strongly about this organization. Okay, so right now this is probably how it feels to you, your world. You're running into brick walls, lots of competition, and there never seems to be a moment to pause. Am I right? Those pictures probably capture your emotional responses these days. What I want to do is not talk about building new relationships. I want to talk about maintaining the relationships you currently have. In today's environment, I truly believe that's going to be more important. OK, folks, play with me here. Any business, any nonprofit organization, any system, think of it as a bucket, OK? And it's filled with water. Do you see that? All right. So what we're trying to do is fill our pail with water. Without the money, there is no mission. Or as uh, uh, one of our speakers said, right? Without the mar margin and uh, the mission have to intersect. I agree. So here's the issue for you. You are trying to fill that pail with water, bringing in new donors, new employees, new clients. Is that clear? But at the same time in your bucket, imagine there are some holes. And that's where they are leaking out, correct? People who no longer support you. People who maybe give you less than they ever did. Now, if this were a practical problem in your house, you have a bucket that you're trying to fill up, and there are holes in the bucket, what would you do rationally? D Plug up those holes. I'm so glad you didn't say buy a new bucket because that would not work with my analogy. So 
What do you have to do today, ladies and gentlemen? Your organization today is like that. That's exactly what it is like. So I'm saying in this environment, it sounds great. Most marketing is macho marketing. Let me go out and get me some new customers today. Fantastic if it works. But in today's environment, we don't ignore that. We are always going to try to reach out to new people. But first, let's protect the relationships we already have. Today, your first order of business should be, how do I plug up those holes? Because if somebody already has a relationship with you, you're already ahead of the game, right? So how do you maintain and nurture those relationships in a tough environment? OK, let me just bring those up. So the topic for today is going to be, it's the profitable art of service recovery. Why do I say this? In any relationship, because we are mortal, there will be errors. Do you agree? No matter how wonderfully streamlined your organization is, something goes wrong. So what we have to do, those service failures, those problems are the holes in that bucket. Because every time I'm let down, it's putting a new hole in that relationship. So what do you do to recover? You need to make sure that you don't just fix the car, you fix the customer. Young lady, every time I say car, I'm coming to you. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's not about your car. So Saturn, Saturn came up with this. They said that if when your car had a problem and they brought it in, they knew that it wasn't enough to fix the car. They have to do that. That's absolutely necessary. But they need to the fix the trust that was breached. So that's what they mean by fix the car and the customer. It's not like fixing dogs and cats. You know, you're really saying, make sure that that is whole. That trust is whole. Is that clear? That's what I want to focus on today. Because problems are happening. This is a reality. And we need to say, how do I hold on to the relationships that I have? OK, ladies and gentlemen, this is recovery. So please don't be upset with me. I thought I'd have a little fun. I figured if I'm talking about recovery, it has to have some steps. Does that sound all right? So these are the seven steps to recovery in your relationships. This message holds true for any relationship and for any customer group. I hope you see that. And any questions or comments, you can jump in at any time. You ready? So what is the first step to recovery? I want you to think of every one of your organizations as a gymnast, right? When you watch a gymnast, what really amazes me is not that they're just so wonderful. I always appreciate that. But what amazes me is what happens when they fall. This might be a crushing defeat to them. A few minutes, they've been training for years. But when you look at them, they get right back up. So it's not about never falling. It's about how quickly, how flexibly, how gracefully you recover. So think of your system as a gymnast. Now, the fundamental problem in our organizations is that we don't know when there's a service failure. This sounds unbelievable to you. You say, oh, no, 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 I'm aware of everything that goes on in my organization. <laughs> the vast majority of time, you do not even know that a problem has occurred. Why? In most organizations, do we run to problems or run away from problems? Seriously. There's a problem. You know it's out there. You're like, good luck. You know, I'm here for you, right? So do we have a culture of running to a problem and acknowledging it? Or after you've solved the problem, do you really go out and tell your colleagues about it? Let's assume you fixed it. No, that's not our natural inclination. It's like, there was a problem. I took care of it. I move on. But the difficulty with that is there may be many people having that exact same issue. But because we haven't shared with one another, we're always reinventing the wheel. OK? So the first thing I want to do, you to do, this is homework, quite seriously, is the first step is to say, how do I know when problems are occurring in my organization? Because that relationship you have that you've built is very fragile, and it costs you way, way, way more to find a new customer, to attract a new donor, than to keep one that you already have. 
Okay? So we always want to know when there's been a problem. How do you do that? There's two ways for your organization. Be creative. I hope you like these examples. One is to have hard standards and measures. And I'll give you plenty of examples of this. What are hard standards? This, you and I can objectively agree, is a problem. Okay? So these are things that can be counted, seen, measured, and you and I can each independently count them, and we would agree objectively that this is an issue. For hard standards and measures, you never need to talk to your customers. You never need to ask a donor, is there a problem? You can just know it internally. All right? But then there are other things which we call soft standards. These are subjective. You don't get to decide if the donor is satisfied with the service that they're providing you. If your board member feels satisfied with the service that you're providing. Is that clear? It's like saying a soft standard, you can only know by hearing it directly from that person in the relationship. So maybe I tell people uh, that when someone walks into our door, they need to be greeted with a smile. How's that? You know, be friendly, invite them in. And then a, a customer complains and says, when I walk in, that was so unfriendly. And you come and talk to me. I'm the employee there. And I say, what's wrong? I smiled, right? I smiled. It's the customer's prerogative to say, not wide enough, <laughs> right? Where were the teeth? You know, that was fake. <laughs> Is that clear? The difference between a hard standard and a soft standard? We need both. So what's the second step in service recovery? Well, in a relationship, when you go back and hopefully talk about this, I genuinely want you to be super successful. And I really want you to go through this exercise. This is what I put my corporate clients through, and this is what I want you to do. Supposing you come up with a long list of things that you could fix so that you are stronger than before. How do you prioritize them? It's a very simple idea because you'll come up with a lot. If you don't have a system streamlining, what happens is you will manage by anecdote. What will happen is someone will say, last week this happened. We need to fix that. And yeah, maybe you should fix that, but that was the first time it happened in 10 years. And there's something else that's much more prevalent. Or people will remember, two years ago, that was a huge problem. So today you say, what should be fixed? And everybody jumps on that. Because it was vivid to them, it's no longer relevant in today's environment. OK? So create a very simple chart. Get your people engaged in this. This is not for you to do by yourself in one room. Get your associates together and say, what are some common barriers? What are we doing to hurt ourselves in a relationship? Say, how frequently do they happen? And how severe are they when they happen? Right? A two by two. Very simple. And try to say, well, if it's very, very serious when it happens, but it's relatively infrequent, you still need to have a crisis plan for that, correct? Because it may not happen every day, but if it did, it would be devastating. <coughs> Let's say that something is, happens all the time. We always are late in sending some information out. We don't get back to people when we say we do. That may be very frequent. It may not be severe. It may not be a, a relationship breaker. But you say, that is something that I can solve because it makes everybody's life better. Am I right? Is it fun to have someone say, you didn't do this right? Is it fun to have to explain to somebody why you didn't do what you did? So this really helps the morale of everyone. If we can take care of a problem, that's a nuisance for everybody. But of course, your fundamental priority should be, if you had unlimited time and unlimited dollars, you tackle all of them at the same time. But given we don't live in that world just yet, you would say, what is it that happens most frequently has the greatest impact. Because that's the hole we need to plug first. Let's get our energies around that. OK, folks? The third step for you is to break the silence aggressively. Get people to tell you there is a problem. What percentage of the US population do you think across industries directly complains to an organization, to the company that they're upset with. It's less than 
really very, very few people complain directly to the company. You're probably looking at me saying, no, no, Neely. You don't know my clients. 100% of them complain. <laughs> it seems that way to you. I'm not denying that, but that's not reality. The vast majority of us, what do we do when there's a problem? Do we go in and complain? No. We walk away. We complain with our feet. We complain with our wallet. And we complain by telling everybody we know how lousy that organization is. So you should try and get people to tell you when there's a problem. Whether it's a board member, whether it's a donor, whether it's an associate, a client, get them to tell you when there's a problem. Now let's talk about this for a second. When they, there's a, there's a book, uh, it's not so much the book, but I love the title, A Complaint is a Gift. I really believe that. You know why? Because in a relationship, if I complain, it means I'm not ready to give up on the relationship yet. I'm giving you one more chance. Because the opposite of love is not hate. It's indifference. When I no longer care and I no longer complain to you, it means I'm out. You are irrelevant to me. So when somebody brings a complaint to you, you should approach it with, this is a gift I've been given to salvage this relationship. So that's the third step. What's the fourth step? Act fast. So when, you, when I say act fast, there's two points I want you to remember. The longer you take to fix my problem, the more egregious it gets in my mind. It's like when someone's gone fishing, right? The first time they tell you the story, this was, was so big, the fish. By the tenth time, it was a whale, right? So but the more we talk about it, and especially if it's a problem you haven't resolved, it's really grating on me. As the day goes on, as the next day goes on, the problem gets more and more magnified in my mind. And now it'll take more to make me happy. So try and act as quickly as you can. Now when you do that though, it doesn't mean you should give them wrong information because you're acting so quickly. When I say act fast, call back and say, we heard you, we'll get back to you, and then follow up. Number five. This if you want to act fast, if you want to act effectively, you must train and empower your front line. Everyone in your company should know what your organization stands for. More importantly, they should know what your priorities are for the organization. This is the test I use for any company I consult with. They say we've had a strategic plan. Go talk to the janitor, go talk to the receptionist, go talk to executives in various areas and say, what are your key priorities for this coming year? What's your mission? You will be surprised at how many Fortune 50 companies, whatever you make up, will fail that test. So in your organization, everybody should know in this time what your organization stands for. And just as important, what are the key priorities for the organization? The other thing you have to remember is that when you're on a fl the front line, the customer is not always right. But if you're on the front line, you have to take that, not take it emotionally. Be able to respond. All right, close the loop. When someone complains to you, you need to get the information back into the system as well as to the client or to the customer. So it's not enough if you just took care of it Internally, you need to keep a log so you know this problem occurred and this is what we did. This is also important for you to track because if you don't, you will not know, ladies and gentlemen, if it's a chronic complaint or a chronic complainer, right? You need to know, am I hearing this from the same person a million times? What's going on? So for you to be able to decide where to act, you must close the loop. All right, I have a little acronym for this. When I say close the loop, there are so many out there. Use what you want. But I'm going to tell you that if anyone brings up a problem, I want you to make a lasting impression. L-A-S-T, easy, right? So tell everyone in your organization, we want to make a lasting impression. What does it stand for? If anyone brings a problem to your attention, you listen, 
you apologize. You solve and then you thank them. I think we should talk about this because it's getting talked about quite a bit. This is called the recovery paradox. This is the idea that if things are going smoothly, people take you for granted. And that sometimes when you've made a mistake, but you've done a great job at recovery, that the customer may be left more satisfied and happy than if the problem had not occurred in the first place. Fine and dandy. But I honestly read a business advice column where a couple of consultants were advising companies to mess up so that they would have a chance to recover. That's why I put this in. It's a very reputed national magazine, so this is not a business journal. That scared me like I can't tell you how much. That is not the way to build an honest relationship. So just stay away from it, okay? That's what I want you to remember because there's no recovery paradox if you keep making the same mistake again and again. So let's assume you're not messing up, but this time you got my invoice wrong, something like that. With you, I'm a vendor, whoever it may be. You uh, apologize and you fix it. You, you do what's necessary. I'm happy. But then next month the same thing happens and the same thing happens. Apology does not work. And that's why you need to get it into the system. Okay, ladies and gentlemen. Now, as you go through this, I want you to remember, it's not just you. Everybody who works with you, everybody who works for you, they want to do a good job. Try to le leverage these. Figure out if they're making a mistake, where it comes from. Is it ability? Is it motivation? Is it not understanding their role? So try to get to the heart of it. Seeds for Growth on the Columbus Collaborative is a co-production of Huntington Bank and WOSU Public Media.